see all of you this morning. It's a great honor and privilege that we all have to come together and be reassembled as Lord's body to worship together and to be edified and uplifted. And I must say what a blessing it is to have our guest with us and to have more Texans in the audience. <laughs> I'm praying that we can spend more time together so my accent can get, can get resurrected. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been losing it as we've, as we've been here. But, yeah, so we're Glad to have you with us. I'm glad for those who will be watching this live or watching this archive. Today, our sermon is titled, The Law of Fruitfulness. Our text will be John 12, 23 through 26. We'll read the text, and then we will go through the different points that are within it so that we can gain application for our edification, our uplift, to be uplifted, and especially to be ready to face a new week and to go about and do the work that's been set before us to do. John 12, 23, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it, Unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. This is not the first time that Jesus has used the illustration of fruitfulness in describing the Christian life. Matthew 13, the parable of the sower going out to sow seed and it falling on the different soils. Verse 23, giving the explanation of the parable and describing that good soil upon which the Word of God is going to be planted and is going to grow. But he that received seed into the good, good ground is he that heareth the Word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. We're going to read again in John 15 as Jesus is alone with His apostles. And illustrating to them, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. We've discussed these. Well, not John 15, but we discussed Matthew 13 in great detail as we were going through our Matthew study. But here in John 12, Jesus gives more explanation of that process and that these contexts are very closely connected. What is being described for us is what does it take to have this fruitfulness? Everybody wants to talk about, yeah, you need to be fruitful in Christ. What does that mean? What's the process? What is actually involved? There have been many discussions on this matter of fruitfulness. All throughout the church's history, there's been a multitude of articles. Why is the church not growing? And specifically, like it was in the explosion eras of the 50s, or the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And everybody's trying to reason out, parse out, figure it out, dissect it. What happened to us? The answer is in this text. Now, most of the time when individuals, brethren, when they want to talk about the fruitfulness of the church... They want to dissect it and deal with it from the standpoint of evangelizing, growing numerically. That's included. But that is a, as we discussed in our class, that's a symptom of another problem. This first 
has its application, not to evangelism, even in the sowing of that seed. Evangelism's in it. But specifically what's being talked about in being producing fruit, that is you as an individual, what you're doing with God's word. How are you growing spiritually? Are we producing that fruit in character and discipleship that Jesus has been looking for? Are we producing that? In our Matthew study, before Jesus enters in to the city of Jerusalem, Matthew records it, I believe Luke records it as well, coming across a fig tree and cursing the fig tree because it wasn't producing fruit. So there again is this illustration. In that context, it was dealing with the nation of Israel. The fig tree represented them. And that while the leaves were green and tender, which should have been a sign of the production of fruit, Jesus comes to the tree finding no fruit on it, curses it, and the tree withers and dies. Because the people... The nation as a whole on the majority were not the kind of people that God was wanting them to be. Now there was a small section inside of the nation that was. That's the Mary, the Martha, the Lazarus. The ones that are going to follow Jesus even through his crucifixion. They are there. And even as we're considering this illustration... And how that's going to tie into how Paul uses the same illustration of fruitfulness when it comes to dealing with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 24. And we're going to read that at a specific point of our sermon today as well. Because all the language is the same. But this is God's law of fruitfulness. If we're wanting to be fruitful in our own lives when it comes to evangelism, this is the way it is. Jesus begins in verse 24 by saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Truly, truly, when Jesus uses these words, it's like he's putting up a stop sign with flashing red lights to get our attention. Here is the truth of the matter. I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is to get the attention of the apostles, of the Greeks that have come to see him, and of the others that are involved in this crowd and it's designed to get the attention of the church but it's also designed to get my attention as an individual if I want to be good soil that's going to produce fruit abide in him to be fruitful here is what it takes do not miss this except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. But if that corn, wheat of corn, corn of wheat, falls to the ground and then dies, then it brings forth much fruit. When we're thinking about this illustration, there are one of three things, there are possibly some other options in here as well, that are possible for us to do when it comes to this discussion about this grain or this corn of wheat falling to the ground. If you're not picking up on it yet, the corn of wheat is you. That kernel is you, your life. One of the things that we can do with that is, you know what, we can just store it up. You can leave it in the barn, you can leave it in the pantry, leave it there for future use, some difficult time, some time in which The harvest isn't that great. 
But in doing that and just storing it up, it's sitting there and it's not doing anything while it's stored. It's just there. All right? Well, we're not wanting to just store it over and have it be useless. Then let's grind it up, meal it up, mix it up, and let's turn it into bread so that we can eat it. So then you're using it for your personal gratification. For your personal use, but then once you've done that, it's still in the same situation as storing it up. It's gone. Now you're not able to do anything with it. It provides a temporary pleasure. But then there's a third option. You can plant it, let it die, and it grows with increase. From the one kernel, from the one wheat kernel, planting that, allowing it to die, and then you come back with a stalk that has a multitude. This is God's law of fruitfulness. The reason why we are not growing is right here. There cannot be any fruitfulness without death. And in this context, Jesus is pointing the application with himself. Jesus is fixing to practice what he is preaching. His life, his corn of wheat, is about to fall into the earth and about to die. And he's going to bring forth much fruit. We have this being connected to the discussion that Jesus had with his apostles, Matthew 16, Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Okay, what does that mean? What does that look like? How are we supposed to do this? And take up his cross daily and follow me. These two illustra illustrations explain the same thing. We must die daily. I have to sacrifice myself daily to be fruitful. And Jesus explains it further. He gives us the reasoning as to what it is that's going to get in our way, where the problem arises. And he lays out that, okay, if you are not going to allow this to happen, you're not going to take on this death, then he just simply says it abides alone. There's nothing produced from it. It's just that, and then that's it. What keeps this from happening is found in verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Right back in Matthew 10, 39, Matthew 16, 25. In the discussion in Matthew 13, with the reason why the seed was not able to grow amongst the thorns is because it is choked by cares, riches, and pleasures of this world. Here ends up being the struggle for everybody. What do we love more? And really, it's a situation of who do we love more? Do I love myself and what it is that I am able to do with this corn of wheat in trying to protect it, trying to save it? 
or even using it up for my own, my own will, my own pleasures, my own desires? Jesus says very plainly, okay, that's going to die alone. That's not the kind of life that produces fruit. Or will I, and this is the phrasing of the word hateth, will I love myself less? And that I will sacrifice, I will set to the side what's mine and allow it to die and to produce. To take that grain, to Use it up. Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of my notes. What we're being shown is the life that will kill self. That will make the daily sacrifices get multitudes back. And it's amazing how that when we're going through context like this and we're seeing the language that's being used that we can end up finding it popping up in different places that we're unfamiliar with it actually being being seen and again this goes back to how we study how we use passages of scripture and specifically we're going to look at Romans chapter 6 next and you know it's unfortunate in studying Romans 6 that all we're getting out of it, the only thing that we're getting out of it is to get people to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That's there. But that's not what it's about. There's more to the discussion that's being found in Romans chapter 6. That in fact Paul is continuing to illustrate to these brethren that have obeyed the gospel and are now Christians and refreshing them and reminding them what they've done. Notice the language in Romans 6, beginning in verse 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, killed, dead with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth... We should not serve sin. Here's the same law being repeated that's being spoken by Jesus in John 12, 24 and 25. Why are we being baptized? That corn of wheat is dying. That old self is being planted. What do you do with a corn of wheat? You plant it in the ground. That man dies to be raised to newness of life. That's where it begins, but that's not where it's finished. We are then raised from death to newness of life to then live what Jesus was exemplifying about carrying our cross. Every day, we are striving to die to self. How will we be fruitful? And evangelism, growing the church numerically, but more importantly than that, is growing ourselves. To have fruit in our daily lives, it's only if we are willing to die to self. While many brethren sit back and scratch their heads and they wonder, well, why are we not saving the world? And it's because many of our brethren are living for themselves. themselves. 
that even when you have individuals that would be willing to obey the truth, and I would even be willing to wager that they're not truly obeying the truth because there are points like this that are being missed. We have people being told, okay, you need to be baptized for the mission of your sins. That's fine and good, but they're not being taught these elements. You're wanting to be a Christian? You have to die every day. You're no longer living for yourself. You belong to someone else. You are becoming a slave to the master. So then individuals end up coming into the Lord's church, and then what do they see going on around them? They don't see people living for the master. They don't see people making any sacrifices. The struggles that we face, we live in pleasures and riches like no one else has. And the danger comes in by thinking, and we end up deceiving ourselves into thinking that all is well. Jesus spent more time teaching on covetousness, materialism than anybody else in the New Testament. And it's usually in those contexts and those connections with covetousness and materialism where he ends up using a lot of his opportunity to teach about hell and damnation. To love our own lives and then end up losing eternity. The only way Jesus is saying to save our lives is to give it away. That's what Jesus taught and that's exactly what he did. When we consider the point that Paul is trying to present in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, contrasting the fruit of the Spirit with that of the works of the flesh, and again, the imagery, illustration is one and the same. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. A lot of people are familiar with this. A lot of them spend their time learning it to be able to quote it. But there are, as we've mentioned in our studies, there are key questions. There are important questions that we need to go through and ask if we're going to comprehend what we're needing to learn. And it's what we started out with. On the topic of fruitfulness, on the topic of producing the fruit of the Spirit, how is this done? What does it take? Verse 24. What it takes is this law of fruitfulness. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Except it be planted and die, it abides alone. With Jesus being the greatest example of this, Jesus could have saved his life. He says of, has, as much. I could call legions of angels. to remove him from that burden. He prayed in the garden, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. He could have loved his life more than anything else. 
But what then? With Jesus, he would have been fine. He was sinless. He could have escaped the cross, died a natural death, and he would have gone on to heaven. But there would have been no multiplied fruit. Would have gone to heaven, been alone. But he died so that fruit could be produced. And that's how it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As Paul is discussing the resurrection and the hope and the faith that we have inside of that. How that Christ himself is described as the first fruits of the resurrection. You plant a garden and the season starts coming and you get that first harvest. And you're all excited because that first harvest is a proof that, okay, there's more coming. But the only way that's possible is if you plant that first seed and it dies. And that's why, right after the start of the church in Acts chapter 2, the first thing recorded is how the brethren were giving themselves to others. Their mindset was that the things that they had were not their own. They did not live selfishly with the things that they possessed with their own time. There's a point of application here that I'm wanting to make. Throughout our time in the book of John, and specifically as we're moving closer to the crucifixion, there's been more and more discussion about sacrifice. And Jordan and Reese even came to ask me about this discussion. And they were asking me if I was upset that possibly they weren't doing enough. Well, reflecting on that conversation in light of this that we're studying, and we even discussed it when they were talking to me about it, they're not asking the right question. And that they're concerned about the wrong person. It shouldn't be, well, is Micah upset that we're not doing enough? What does the master think? And as I pointed out to them in the discussion, it is good that they had that feeling about what was being, not so much about me being upset, but it was good that they were having that feeling about the question. Am I sacrificing enough? We should all be worried about that. Because Jesus is laying out the teaching right here that this is a problem that everybody's going to face. We all should be concerned with the matter of What am I loving more? Because we can deceive ourselves in thinking that, well, it is enough. I have already sacrificed enough. Why should I sacrifice more? Why should I be called to sacrifice more? Well, even Jesus dealt with that discussion. The one that's been blessed with more... What's going to happen to him? He's going to be held responsible to more. And in the grand picture of this, in the grand scheme, in the grand level, 
that we are called every day to carry our cross? The answer for everybody is, no, I'm, at the end of it, I'm really not. And even in this discussion, it's really not my place to say. It's not my place to gauge. Because even Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said to them, you're not needing to measure yourselves by each other. That's foolish to do that. And at the end of the day, I do not know what everybody is involved in. So I'm wanting to give the same sentiment and same word of comfort that I gave to Jordan Reese. I'm just dealing with the text. This isn't pointed at anybody, but this is something that we all need to examine. But you can gauge this yourself. Take a sheet of paper, divide it in half, and then just go through your day. How much time was spent on worldly material things? And then compare that to the time given on kingdom and spiritual things. And then you'll be able to gauge. And even if you want to, going so far as to break it down into you know, hourly categories. Here's the time spent on this. Here's the time spent on that. Because even with all the things that I am involved in doing... I can't say that, well, you guys should be over here doing what I'm doing because if you're all over in the same area working where I'm working, then what's being done in these other areas? Yeah, I want people involved because I want company. I get lonely in doing these things. But if you're off over here laboring in another section of the vineyard of the kingdom, you're one of those laborers that gets hired at a different time of the day. Then okay, God bless you. But even when I'm considering these points and making the application for myself, as I mentioned to Jordan and Reese often, what makes a good sermon is if you're able to Start by making an application for yourself. Is that even with, if I were to fall into that snare and that temptation of wanting to look, try to look at, even though I don't know what everybody's actually doing, and start trying to gauge, well, here's what I'm doing over here. You guys aren't doing what I'm doing. I would then have to take a step back and even ask myself, well, why, why am I playing that game? What's my motivation then I would then start looking at these things from that element. So then I have to look at myself, and we also have to try to gauge these things by this. What's my motivation for why I'm doing what I'm doing? And then for the motivation for everybody else, where are we doing this just because Micah is? Doing this out of fear doing this out of obligation for me because, well, I've got supporters that I have to answer to. So I need to go out here and make sure that I'm busy so that I have something to write about. Well, I'm the one that's being supported to be here, so I need to go out and make sure that I'm making sure the support is worthwhile. 
And if that's my motivation, then I've got a problem. So it all comes back to Mary as that example. Motivated by deep loyalty and love. And that as she saw an opportunity in the moment to do something for the king, that's how we're living our lives every day. Majority of us are working nine to fives. Then okay, you need to do what you can, whatever opportunity arises in that. That's your field. That's your vineyard. And it is unfortunate that we live in a time that even though we have so much advancements in technology that's supposed to free up so much time, but then so much of our time is burdened still. But then it just comes back to the point once again with what Jesus said to Mary. She has done what she could. And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Am I doing what I can? We need to answer that honestly. As we said in class, attaching all of this together to God's law of fruitfulness and that if we are operating from that same motivation, we won't have to be pushed, we won't have to be prodded, we won't have to be pressured. It will just be spontaneous, it will be devoted, it will be undivided. And even as we're going through this now, like I said, I don't want anybody to take this as though I'm trying to push, prod, or pressure anybody. Lessons for teachers, lessons for students. We are simply trying to become more like the Savior every day. And in order to do that, that means we have to die. And so I don't know if I ever mentioned this to Carla. I may just have to save it. I hated it that you had to sell your house and move here. Because of so much that you already had to sacrifice in your life. <clears throat> Going to live in Ukraine. To live in what most would view as being unbearable circumstances. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
and to endure that so people would have the hope of heaven. And that after that sacrifice, she would be called to sacrifice again. But I'm thankful that you would be willing to allow yourself to die in that realm to come here and be with us and to help to produce fruit. And to a large degree, many of us have already been called to sacrifice. And the struggle comes in of I've already sacrificed. What more could I sacrifice? But as we've as we said, if we are really thinking about these things correctly, then we'll have this motivation and Jesus gives the motivation in verse 26 as we draw this to a close. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Well, who can do this? Who's supposed to do this? If any man. This is anybody. Everybody. Whosoever will. What are we supposed to do? Let him follow me. Follow how? What we just discussed. Lay your life down. Sacrifice. Well, and we have also been given to us the illustration of a servant. There shall also my servant be. And that word for servant is what you have for deacon in 1 Timothy 3. You want to be a good servant? You want to be a great deacon? You want to be great in the kingdom? Sacrifice. And here is a di another element of the fruitfulness being laid to us, not just the fact of us growing in those character traits, which are good, wonderful, they create for peaceful lives here on earth. The willingness to be able to die to self again for the benefit of others, to help them out in the redemption of their soul. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. There's a reward. There is something, there's an inheritance that's being laid over for us. Denying ourselves in the present gratification for suspended, later, and eternal gratification. There shall my servant be. If any man serve me, then there's another layer of reward. Him will my father honor. Place of a servant. A slave is not a desired place. It's not a desired position. But with Christ in his kingdom and his church, that is the highest place that you can be.
God honors that. God, as we move through the account, the record of John, God will honor his son because he died to produce a multitude of fruit. He's the first fruits. He's the example. And so we can rest assured and we can trust that if we will live that same kind of life, God is going to honor us. <clears throat> and as we are offering and encouraging people to obey the gospel and to become a Christian, this is what we're talking about. This is what people need to realize that they're signing up for as we are pushing and prodding and promoting for them to hear the gospel, to believe in that gospel message, and this is included in that gospel message. That if we're going to die to self, part of that includes, okay, full faith, full trust, full confidence in what he has said. And part of what he has said is that we have to repent. And there has to be the full acknowledgement of, okay, I was doing wrong. I'm now wanting to do what's right. That takes sacrifice. To confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's not as much sacrifice today as it was in the first century. In the first century, that was sacrifice. John's already told us that the Pharisees had said, anyone that would believe and confess in him is cast out of the synagogue. All throughout this are layers of what are you willing to die for. than to be buried in baptism, be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. And then the journey just begins. And as we go through this journey, it's going to be easier at times to sacrifice than others. And that's where it's so important for us to examine ourselves. For us that are members, brothers and sisters together, to examine ourselves and even at times to look to others for inspiration, to look for, uh, to others for examples. But to the greatest level and to the greatest degree, it's looking to Christ. And just as with Mary and pouring out that perfume and that ointment, when we think about what Christ has done for us, there is never enough that I could do to fully show my thankfulness. but I'm going to do what I can. And we offer, once again, our Lord's invitation for any that need to obey the gospel for the first time or for us that are members of the Lord's church, if we are in need of confession of sin and prayers of repentance or prayers of encouragement, then we offer this time as we stand and as we sing together.